Hi, um, good afternoon, everyone, or good morning, depending on where you are. Um, welcome to today's webinar with Jeremy Levy, CEO and co-founder of Indicative, and Alex Dean, CEO and co-founder of Snowplow. Uh, my name is Tracy, and I am on the marketing team at Indicative. And before I turn the stage over to Jeremy, I did want to mention three things. Um, one, the webinar is being recorded, so uh, you will receive a unique link to the recording in your inbox at the conclusion of the event. Uh, second thing is that you have a window on the right, uh, right side of your screen. Um, there are three tabs there. Uh, one is the chat tab where you can send questions for Jeremy and Alex. There will be time for Q&A at the end. Um, so feel free to submit your questions at any time. Um, there is also a poll tab, and there is a question in there right now. Um, so do answer that now, or you can answer it anytime. Now would be good, um, as it does help shape uh, the conversation. Uh, and then uh, third, there's a handouts tab uh, with an infographic of the best in class tools in the modern data ecosystem uh, that Jeremy will refer to during the webinar. Um, it's a great resource to have and, and to keep. Um, and then lastly, for those of you who are not currently using Indicative, we will have a link to a free trial at the conclusion of the event. So stick around for it. Um, we encourage you to register and give the product a spin. Um, okay, so now I'm gonna turn it over to Jeremy. Thank you, Tracy. Welcome to the first in a series of webinars around the modern data ecosystem hosted by or featuring Indicative. Today, we're sitting down with Alex Dean from Snowplow to discuss how to leverage behavioral data in the modern data stack. During this webinar, we'll cover three topics, an introduction to Snowplow, behavioral data collection in the age of privacy, and operating your business in the modern data ecosystem. Before we get started, let me give you a little bit of background on me and on Indicative. I'm Jeremy Levy, and I'm the CEO and co-founder of Indicative. Indicative launched in 2014 and is a product analytics platform that is built to connect directly to a company's data warehouse. Indicative is used by product managers, data analysts, and growth marketers to analyze complex behavioral data without the need for SQL or writing code, used to increase customer engagement, conversion, and retention. Joining me today is Alex Dean, the CEO and co-founder of Snowplow. Snowplow is a partner of Indicative and is a behavioral data platform that collects and operationalizes behavioral data at scale. Welcome, Alex. Well, uh, thanks. Thanks for having me. It's really, uh, it's great to be here. Thanks, Jeremy. Alex, maybe we could start with helping everyone understand what exactly is Snowplow? Yeah, sure thing. So um, Snowplow is a platform that helps companies to generate and then enrich and uh, improve the quality of and then deliver and an analyze their behavioral data. So um, maybe not everyone on the call is familiar with, with what, what we mean by behavioral data. What we're talking about is really the kind of the signal that um, a, a, an organization's uh, customers are kind of giving off when they're interacting with um, that organization's digital properties. So on their websites, on their mobile apps, even interacting with backend server side systems and things like that. So we're talking about page views, button clicks, screen views in mobile apps, all that sort of thing. And Snowplow, I mean, we've been, been around for quite a while. We started um, the, the project, open source project back in 2012. Um, we're all about kind of helping companies to kind of generate and, and, and get that very rich behavioral data, get it into the warehouse, get it into the data lake, get it into um, event streams as well for, 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 the, for the processing, analytics, and, and other kind of use cases downstream. Alex, can you help us understand Snowplow in the context of sort of the CDP? I know Snowplow is not a CDP. Can you help contrast it to what people think of as CDPs? Yeah, I sure think so. Um, th there's sometimes a bit of confusion on that, um, but it's it's important to kind of explain the differences. Um, and I think the, the point of confusion is that um, our primary data source, the data that we care about deeply at Snowplow, behavioral data, it's often a, it's often a kind of a, a, a data source that um, CDPs use. So CDPs kind of uh, trying to bring in all sorts of customer data, um, basically for marketing teams to then meet their needs with typically in a kind of kind of packaged way. Snowplow is a bit different. So, you know, the Snowplow um, platform 
we're getting that behavioral data into the warehouse, into the different storage options, as, as you show in, in, in your great um, modern data infrastructure diagram. Um, but then loads of different teams will, will, will meet different use cases on top of that. So, you know, you can do product analytics with the Snowplow data. Um, you can do fraud detection. You can do um, uh, churn prediction or churn reduction. Um, and so there's lots of different teams inside an organization that are going to want to use that behavioral data. Um, so to, to kind of round it out, you could build a CDP with, with Snowplow, and we have customers that do that because they have specific requirements and, and the kind of the, the package CDPs aren't, aren't right for them. Um, but equally, like there are, there are lots of non-CDP um, related use cases, lots of um, need for, for, for behavioral data outside of the marketing team that Snowplow meets. And you know, our, our, our primary kind of users and our primary customers are kind of data practitioners, data teams. And so those are the kind of organization um, organizational structures that, uh, that adopt Snowplow and bring it into the modern data, data stack. So, you know, I've been aware of Snowplow since you guys started in 2012, even frankly before Indicative was started in the data system, the data ecosystem. And your approach has always appealed to me personally as a technologist. I always, I always thought that the idea of both owning your own data that Snowplow provides for, as well as the fact that I am able to own to some extent part of my infrastructure by way of the fact that Snowplow is open source, really resonates with me personally. Can you tell us a little about how you start or why you started Snowplow and how the open source aspect of that model has 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 impacted the business? Yeah, definitely. So um, it, it, it's a long and windy road. I, I won't take up too much too much time on it. But um, but my co-founder Yali and I. So we started the the project back back in 2012. So we've been doing um, quite a lot of consulting for, um, for for businesses in the UK, and we've been doing kind of marketing analytics for them, some product analytics, um, some customer analytics. And we noticed that they had really good kind of offline transactional data. So the, the kind of data that in your um, diagram would, would be pulled in um, maybe via an ETL tool or an ELT tool. Um, but they didn't really have any rich kind of, um, back then we used to call it clickstream data. Now it's kind of evolved into, into what we call behavioral data. But they didn't really have access to that. So, you know, they would have packaged analytics tools like Omniture back then or Google Analytics, but that's not what we wanted. We wanted like, you know, every single button click, every single page view, because we knew if we could get access to that um, and uh, we could do any analysis we wanted, we could answer any question, we could solve any any use case. So that was, that was the original genesis, that was back in 2012. Um, and so we spent the first few years, 2012 up to 2015, kind of finding that project community fit, um, kind of bringing that together, listening to the market, figuring out what people wanted Snowplow to do. Um, and then we kind of started commercializing a little, a little bit later, kind of 2015 onwards. Got it. I'm um, going to shift the conversation a little bit now and talk about um, ownership of, of data and data privacy and user privacy for that matter. Um, as it relates to um, the issue of user privacy, privacy issues are very much at the forefront today with GDPR, CCPA, um, Brexit, which complicates data privacy laws between the EU and the UK, and as well as the very public battle between Apple and Facebook. How are these privacy laws impacting data collection? Mm, it's a really, really good question, and it's a really, really big, important topic. I would say that um, the pendulum is definitely sort of swinging back into um, people being much more concerned, rightfully so, about data subjects and the needs and the, the rights of data subjects. I think that um, the, the, the wider trend, and you see it with GDPR, CCPA, you see it with different um, national laws, and there'll probably be super, super national laws um, in the future as well. Um, you see that the, there's just this kind of general concern that there are um, players out there that are trying to do, um, you know, very broad brush, very sweeping roll-ups of, 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 of the data of, of, of individuals. Um, and so that's definitely kind of a, a, a big backdrop to, to everything that's happening in the kind of behavioral data and broader kind of customer data collection space. Um, in terms of the way we think about it, so Snowplow has always been really much about kind of first party behavioral data collection. So, you know, our open source is used by a, a, a large number of organizations around the world, but they use it, you know, to collect their, to, to understand their own customers' behavior on their own properties. Um, there are some open source users who are using us in a more networked fashion, but, you know, I, I think that's not, frankly, the direction of travel. Um, and it's the same with our customers. So the main, um, you know, our primary commercial model of Snowplow is a private SaaS model. So we run Snowplow inside of organizations own uh, cloud accounts, so inside their own AWS and Google.
Alex, did we did we lose you? All right, let's uh, let's give Alex just a moment here to see if he can reconnect. It's like we're having some technical difficulties. Let's just give this another minute or so. Apologize for the issues here, everybody. Let's just give this another minute or two, see if we can get Alex back on. While we're waiting for Alex, um, I'll describe a little bit about what people are looking at on the screen right now. Uh, on the screen is a infographic that we created that describes modern data infrastructure. Uh, as, uh, as the data warehouse has become more of the center of the data warehouse inside of businesses and organizations, there have emerged many best-in-class solutions that provide functionality such as Snowplow in terms of helping to collect and put behavioral data directly into the warehouse, as well as the tools to help manage data within that, ecos within that data warehouse, as well as tools to help operationalize, perform analytics on, and help get value from data. Uh, the infographic that you're looking at um, helps to helps people navigate what are the best in class solutions within this ecosystem. We developed this specifically to help our audience understand when building a modern data infrastructure, what are the tools and the services they should look at to help them in building that ecosystem and that infrastructure. I think um, I think we'll give Alex maybe another 30 seconds and then we may have to unfortunately reschedule here. Um, I, again, I apologize to everyone for uh, for the issues that we're having. I guess this is the uh, the problem with live webinars. Looks like we have a question from Tutor. The question is, I was under the impression that Indicative also provides functionality to record user behavior. Is that correct? Um, Tutor, yes, that's right. Indicative has the ability to connect directly to a data warehouse as well as collect that data as well. Or oh, Alex, looks like we got you back. Wonderful. Sorry about that. I'm not sure what happened there, but um, yeah, it's it's back. It's back. And uh, um, yeah, sorry. Where were we? No, I, I'm glad you're back. As I was, for, I was about to start telling jokes, and I'm sure nobody <laughs> wants to hear that. <laughs> um, so sorry. Okay. About that. So yeah, maybe let's just try to pick it up where we left off. We were talking about data privacy and how this impacted yes. data collection, and you were talking about first and third party cookies. Maybe. Uh, you could explain what the difference between those actually are, why they matter to our audience, and how um, Snowplow is uniquely positioned to be able to help companies when browsers are changing restrictions around these types of cookies. Yeah, sure, sure thing, Jeremy. Yeah, apologies for that disruption. Um, so I, I think the way to think of it is that the direction of travel in the industry is nobody really wants, including the browser vendors, no one really wants third parties to be kind of collecting and tracking a lot of different users across a lot of different domains and a lot of different properties using kind of things like third party cookies, um, which, which kind of are uh, shared, shared, um, shared identifiers across multiple different domains. Um, and so the direction of travel is um, really in it, towards first party collection by organizations themselves, that's okay, that's allowed, that's acceptable, um, but really kind of outside of that, so things like third-party cookie collection, kind of much, much, much less so. Um, so to, to sort of uh, bring it back to Snowplow, 
And um, Alex, just just for clarity, though, when yeah. we talk about third party cookies, we're talking or versus first party cookies. First party cookies are data that my website would collect about my users. Third party cookies would be ones that sort of sit across many, many websites. So I think sort of the, the, the punching bag would be Facebook, for example. Every time someone has Facebook on their site, they can track you by way of third party cookies across all of those sites. That's exactly right. And those third party cookies are deteriorating over time because browser uh, browser vendors and others are, are just, you know, ad blockers and people like that are, are just not um, not supportive of that that uh, that approach anymore. And the other kind of approach is just a, a, a broadly pretty discredited and, uh, you know, um, browser fingerprinting and um, uh, um, local storage and things like that. It's uh, those are all kind of um, sort of tracking dead ends, I think. Um, and so yeah, with 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 Snowplow, so you've got um, you've got um, open source users of Snowplow obviously setting it up and running our kind of behavioral data engine, the core processing themselves, um, and and putting that on a an endpoint, their own endpoint. So you know, um, behavioraldata.acme.com or whatever. And it's the same with Snowplow customers actually. So the way we um, the way we sell Snowplow, we um, I think this is what I was saying before I got cut off. Apologies. Uh, we we deploy Snowplow into customers' own cloud accounts and then that you know it's there it, we're running the software for them but it's their data collection their behavioral data uh platform running in their own infra and they'll set up their own um uh domains and things like that so it's first party data collection uh, we're not we're not the data controller as snowplow we're, we're just a, we're just a processor for people so if customers are using snowplow they don't necessarily have to worry about the the current issues surrounding third party cookies and data collection from that perspective they don't have to worry about their ability um to work with their customer data to be impacted yeah that's correct that's correct so yeah we we and that's an important part of our, our roadmap to make sure customers can uh, keep keep collecting their own behavioral data Alex, I, on, while we're on the topic, I'd be curious to hear your thoughts on how you think about current data privacy legislation. So things like GDPR or um, the invalidation of uh, Privacy Shield and how that's impacting companies from where you guys sit in the ecosystem. Yeah, I think I think it's a really good question, Jeremy. I think that um, I, I think the legislation is needed. I think that people you know organizations need to start taking the the, the rights of data subjects seriously and our, our view at snowplow is that if um the, that it's it's reciprocal right so if you are working hard to 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 understand what your customers are doing and you're using that understanding to drive improvements in your service offering to them so you're building data products or you're understanding like how to how to give them more appropriate content recommendations or product recommendations or you're understanding kind of what are the um the, the blind spots or the cul-de-sacs in your product using indicative for example and then figuring out how to improve your product and and, and improve kind of customer satisfaction we see that as like a really sensible direction of travel so we don't think that um behavioral data collection should be kind of um, in opposition to kind of data subject rights, we think that if you're doing it right, then it's kind of it's a it's a positive feedback loop. Um, yeah, so it, it shouldn't be you know it shouldn't be extractive, it shouldn't be uh, extractive, and it shouldn't be transactional either. I, I I completely agree with your perspective on this in terms of there's a balance between me as a user want my I want to own my own data, I want to protect my data, I want to have the right for my data to be forgotten to some extent, but also as a as a product, let alone a data product, yeah. um, I want to be able to build the best possible product for my customers. And data is obviously a big focus of that. My thought, though, on the regulation is that um, it is onerous today f to operate in the data ecosystem. And I see that very much in the form of Privacy Shield was very helpful for US companies and, and companies in the EU. Without that, it's created a lot of additional friction from a mm, deal perspective. Um, so you know, while I think the sentiment of these things is completely correct, moving in the right direction, I think we're not there yet on an implementation perspective from a contractual rights perspective, that it's still really hard for small businesses to be able to do um, complex legal review and so on when it comes to working with data. Um, yeah, totally agree. Let me shift the, the, the subject again. Um, while you dropped off for a moment, I started talking about sort of the modern data ecosystem. Mm -hmm. um, there is a concept that has emerged, uh, um, at least in sort of my uh, thought, thought area, 
around this notion of the best in class modern data ecosystem data infrastructure and there's a consensus around that across the industry that i know that that you and yali share um it would be great if you could define what does the modern data ecosystem even mean what does it encompass and then also what does that mean for snowplow Oh, how long have we got? This is a really, this is a big topic, Jeremy, as you as as you know, and and you know, I think I think your diagram does a does a great great job of of, of bringing some clarity to to what we're talking about here. So I think the um, where to start. I think we sort of have to start with the with with the storage, with you know the the revolutions that we've had in the in the last kind of five to, five to ten years around cloud compute, cloud storage, the ability to have cloud data warehouses, as, you, as you've highlighted there. And I think this has been a very transformational thing. Um, you know, it's almost kind of, um, it's almost created a kind of a new new brain for organizations. And and it's a new center of gravity, right? And, you know, the, the cost profiles changed. It's now possible to put all your behavioral data in there, extracts from all your transactional systems and, and, and so forth, IoT, all sorts of different things. And um, and that's really created, I think, this kind of, I've heard it described as a sort of a Cambrian explosion of different tools, different vendors, different processes, different philosophies, but all centered around this idea of like, if we get the, you know, all the data and, and, and you know, get it into the, into the stores um, in a really high quality fashion, and then we bring uh, tools and packages and processes to bear on that, we can solve really, really interesting problems that, that really were kind of out of reach before or were being solved in very kind of point solution style ways or in silos or in kind of packaged, um, narrow kind of packaged end-to-end uh, -end products. And so this is a huge disruption. Um, you know, it, in some ways it's sort of almost like the unbundling of the, the data flows of the business. Um, and um, yeah, we're, we're really excited to, to see it happening and, and to see it um, gathering, gathering steam as, as I know you guys are. So, um... In, in terms of sort of this modern e ecosystem, um, how should companies think about approaching building one for themselves? Are there questions that they should ask themselves? Where would a company start in terms of thinking, how do I bring this notion of the modern data ecosystem uh, to my own business? Yeah, I, th I think that it's, um, it's, it's important to start out on the right foot and it's a it's a complex crowded space so it's kind of like it's not obvious kind of what the right starting point should be um i think that uh the data warehouse or the data lake that's an that's an important building block that's going to be a kind of a center of gravity um and then i think you've got to think a little bit around what are the kind of pools of data the pots of data that are significant and meaningful to your business and then what are the kind of the the, the initial kind of use cases, whether they're analytical use cases or, um, you know, some sort of gnarly data product that you weren't able able to build or solve with, in, a, in a packaged way, what's that kind of killer app in a way that, that you want to start building to? Because, you know, I, there, there are a lot of companies that just hit a certain kind of point in the data maturity and they're like, okay, we're ready to kind of move off of, um, you know, maybe um, packaged tools or marketing clouds or whatever and start building the modern data stack. And they build it almost from a sort of a First principles, as in, you know, I, I need one of, I need the kind of best of breed from each of these boxes, and that works, and we see more organisations doing that. But I think equally, um, if you can start from a, a use case, a, a data product that you want to kind of spike out end to end, um, I think that's a that's a really meaningful way of doing it as well. So um, you mentioned this earlier in terms of when we talked about CDPs and um, that companies are building their own CDPs. Do you see uh, data warehouses and this notion of the modern data ecosystem, uh, the, the Cambrian explosion of best-in-class tools, um, ultimately replacing the traditional uh, package CDP for companies as, as ease of use has become so much easier now in terms of how you leverage data within this modern data infrastructure. I, I, it's, a, it's such a good question. And we, we, we talk about this and think about this a lot at Snowplow. I think that, um, I, I think we'll see a mix and I think we'll see things evolving over time. I think definitely once a company kind of... Um, oh, yeah. Uh, oh, no, you're back. Okay, good. <laughs> I think that definitely uh, once a company starts to productionize use cases using this kind of stack, they're going to get more confident and they're going to start seeing that, oh, maybe I don't want to run this use case inside of that tool. Maybe you know, because of ITP or cookies or, um, you know, doing this, do, solving this problem, marketing attribution is a nice example, product analytics is another good one. Solving this with the modern data stack is just gonna be 
more specific to my business. It's going to use more data that's kind of bespoke to my business. Um, so I think I think there'll be a lot of coexistence. Um, and you know, the, the modern data stack is not ready to, to meet all kind of line of business needs for all use cases today. Um, but it's definitely going in that direction. And and like you said, like so many people want this future to work and 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 to to keep working on that. So you know, you think about all the you know the data quality guys, data observability. Uh, you guys, you think about everyone working to make uh, make make the modern data stack kind of like solve solve kind of you know all the problems, meet all the use cases. So that that brings up sort of another question around how people are leveraging this data. Um, are companies or teams going to be structured differently with regards to the modern data infrastructure? So in other words, data scientists sort of came about. Um, because working with data is really hard and there's an additional layer of value you can get from sort of deep analytical insights, but they're really hard and they're hard to come by. As tools have evolved, they become easier to use. Do you see the ease of use from the data infrastructure, from modern data infrastructure, changing the way teams are being set up and teams are being built to work with this data? It's a really good question. Um, we see a lot of diversity in how teams are structured and how organizations are structured around uh, around data uh, across our customer base. Um, I think there's a few different patterns we're seeing. So um, we've seen, especially in kind of mid-market and slightly smaller organizations, we've seen a, a central data team that kind of does all the things and so owns the whole stack and kind of works almost as a bit of a service desk to, uh, to lines of business that are maybe a bit less kind of data mature and less analytically sophisticated. So we see that a lot. Um, in slightly larger organizations, we see we see quite a few of these sort of data platform teams, um, and they're kind of much less aware of how the data is going to be used, um, but they're they're focused on kind of you know making making sure really good quality data gets into the data warehouse or the data lake, and you know they look at things like orchestration and data quality per your diagram, but then actually kind of it's more like sort of the lines of business teams downstream that will have their own embedded data capability and will sort of build the data products and meet the use cases. So we see all of that. Um, we haven't seen much of the kind of the data mesh concept yet, um, but we're quite interested in that and the idea of sort of splitting out sort of source and consumption domains. Um, so that's an interesting one as well. But, but yeah, I, I think people are still figuring it out and figuring out what works for their company. And a lot of it's going to depend on kind of yeah access to, to to talent and how many data practitioners you have and you know are they going to be centrally run are they going to is it possible to embed them into the different teams so yeah I I, I wish I could give you an answer but it's it it, it seems to be very diverse and, and and evolving quite quickly at the moment yeah I think the trend that I observe is that the technical bar to leverage data and maintain it is decreasing relatively yes, rapidly that's true and then. The, the ownership of data, data products, data enablement is moving away from technical teams. And this is obviously not happening overnight, but more towards product teams, marketing teams, and so on, who don't necessarily have to get into the bits and the bytes. Um, next question, Alex, you, you and Yali had incredible foresight with building Snowplow. So, you know, to the extent that Thanks. I don't know if there were other, I, I don't know if there were other um, uh, data collection frameworks at that time or platforms at the time. And certainly the data warehouse was not cheap or easy to use. In those days, it was very expensive and cumbersome. And so, you know, I, I don't know if I don't know if the future has sort of shaped up today the way you anticipated it in 2012. But I'd be curious to ask you, where is this ecosystem going? So, you know, where are we going to be in the next two years, four years, 10 years, and so on? Ah, oh, that is um that's a really, really good question. I think that we we kind of saw the space emerging quite early. I think it, it, I think it, like all things, it moved slowly and then it moved really fast. And you know, the original Snowplow came out even before uh, Redshift was 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 launched. We were yeah. lucky enough to be on the kind of private beta of that, and 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 the rest is history. But um, but yeah, and then obviously there's been this rapid rapid acceleration that you guys have seen as well since kind of 20, 2018, I would say, is when the you know the the cloud warehouses really really took off. Um, in terms of what's next, I think that there's, um, I think there's still a couple of years of bedding down for the um, for the, the the cloud warehouses. I think there's still a lot of um, almost kind of legacy accounts, if you will, for um, people like BigQuery and Snowflake uh, and Redshift to to take over um, from the you know Teradata's and Verticals of the world. 
I think there's a huge kind of blue ocean of just uh, companies, organizations that have never had a data warehouse um, before that, that they can go after as well. Um, I think I think we'll we'll see some interesting back and forth between data warehouses, data lakes, um, the lake house, all that kind of stuff. Um, and I think the the role that real time is going to fit into all these architectures is still, you know, still really kind of up for grabs. Um, I think we saw that uh, the Confluent guys have just uh, just just published their, their their filing for IPO, and so it's you know it's really interesting to think how does real time fit into this story as well. Um, I think that in the in the longer longer term you know, kind of more like sort of five to 10 years, there's some really interesting questions around, do we do we maintain this kind of unbundled kind of best of breed modern data infrastructure data stack? Or do we start to see kind of consolidation and different pieces moving together as kind of, you know, maybe maybe best of breed wins certain categories and then they start to come together? I, I, I don't know. I think that data just moves so quickly that, you know, we could see loads of innovation all of these different um areas of, of the, the the modern data modern data infrastructure for, for years to come but um yeah what, what's your what's your take on it um so maybe just to talk on the consolidation aspect yeah. i think that um there are a lot of sort of cycles that yes. happen in these types of um these technologies so to yeah. to explain that we'll be look at things like uh, Adobe Marketing Cloud is being sort of the poster child for the monolithic proprietary stack that did to some extent everything, um, except for the fact that it was closed in the sense that if you wanted to leverage your data, you couldn't do that. And I think that um, the shift that we have now to where there are best in class solutions, this um, Cambrian Explorers, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna use that from now on, by the way, um, has, has only, made the ecosystem stronger, better, more efficient, and inspired so much more um, just evolution and growth in our area. And I think that's why, you know, sort of this topic of the modern data infrastructure is so exciting because there's so much happening here right now. Yeah. I, th I think the historical benefit for consolidation in a model of application has been integration, has been it's really hard to tie all these tools together because yeah. that requires data engineering. Data engineering is engineering and it's work and it's expensive and it's often bespoke. So it's not repeatable at, at company after company after company. What I think, and again, I, I give so much credit to you and Yali, what you guys have helped pioneer is the fact that getting standardized data in an easy way into a data warehouse, data warehouses or data lakes or data lake houses, you know, to some extent, they all speak the lingua de franca of data. They all speak SQL, and that has now become a common integration point for us. So to some extent, the integration burden has been reduced. So I, I think that the short answer is, I think business and economics will drive consolidation. I think it's just inevitable. But I think from a consumer perspective, all of us as consumers of these data tools, um, having the ability to plug and play the best in class tools helps everybody. It creates the space and the opportunity for companies, you know, new companies to get created that solve really important problems and then get wide distribution through open source um, adoption and so on. And it and it's great for you for for businesses alike because we we don't get locked into an individual type of um, proprietary ecosystem, which are expensive to move away from and don't necessarily keep up with emerging trends. So, you know, I have sort of two competing thoughts here. The, the, the decentralization is really powerful for all of us um, as business people. You know, obviously consolidation wouldn't be a bad thing for us either. Um, and I think that's probably inevitable. Yeah, I, I, I totally agree. I think the, um, I think the big unknown, um, and it's something we sort of think about a fair bit at Snapout, is like how, um, how the rate limiting step, I think, on all of this is how many data practitioners can come into um, in, in, into the world in, in the next few years. And, you know, um, to, to really kind of get this modern data infrastructure humming, um, you, you need, you know, you need good data practitioners and they can they can learn and they can onboard and they can go through great like training programs and things. But you need um, you need talent. And, you know, all of us are in the business of trying to help companies um, get by and achieve their, their 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 goals and their use cases with with a smaller kind of uh, you know with as without needing kind of a load of data practitioners that just aren't out there because it's you know it's so constrained. But um, but that's a really big question, right? Like how many um, data engineers can can come into the market? How many data scientists? Like the 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 need of businesses to to solve these kinds of problems is only going up. Yeah, yeah. I, I'm I'm endlessly fascinated by this topic, obviously. 
Um, Alex, that's all the questions I had. I want to thank you just very briefly before no, I turn you. this over to uh, to Tracy. I do see that we have a bunch of questions in the uh, in the chat. I'm gonna I'm gonna let Tracy um, moderate um, and uh, getting those getting those asked. Yeah, so we do have a bunch of questions, um, and we also uh, have some that came in from yesterday when we reached out to registrants um, to solicit some questions. So we have some of those. We have time. We have about, I don't know, about eight minutes, so we'll get to as many as we can. Um, but to get back to uh, this uh, discussion on the team, right, um, one of the first questions we had come in today is, you know, what are the best practices for matching a data engineer, a data analyst, software engineer roles to each of the sections in that infographic, right? Sort of the left of the data warehouse, storage, and the right of the data warehouse. Sort of, sort of I, you know, I think it's a, it's a broad question, but. Um, no, it's a good, it's a, it's a really good question. Um, so I would say that, um, I would say that kind of your your data practitioners, so your your, your data engineers, um, uh, data analysts, they're they're gonna they're gonna um, they're gonna operate in different ways across the stack. So, um, data engineers are gonna be responsible a lot for um, ingest and for quality and uh, making sure that um, the, the the sort of general pipes are working. Um, and then data analysts and data scientists are gonna work much more downstream. So they're gonna work much more kind of right of, right of warehouse, uh, right of lake. Um, general software engineers um, could be involved in downstream data products. So building recommend, recommendation engines, things like that. Um, they could be involved really upstream. So um, for example, integrating tracking into, um, into your, your mobile apps or your websites and things like that. Um, but broadly, you're gonna have some kind of data team and they're gonna be, um, they're gonna have as a group, a lot of responsibility end to end for the modern data stack. So you don't want it to kind of fall into silos or it's sort of not my jobism. You want to make sure there's people who are kind of concerned end to end with uh, with, with the with the stack. Um, Jeremy, did you want to add, an, add, add anything on that one? No, I, I mean I think that makes sense. The the the, the infographic, at least as, as we put together, does cover multiple um skill sets and i think that's a really interesting point and i wonder if our next iteration we should think about how we can um highlight that but you know to some extent some of the tools are ones that are designed for end users to use some are designed for data engineers to use um and some of them are um um are designed for business users to use and so on and so you know uh, you know i think i, I would almost harken back to alex's answer a moment ago which is you have to think about what are the use cases at your company that you want to support mm -hmm. What are the best in class tools that support that? And then look at whether or not those line up to a product person, a data engineer, or, and so on and so on. So yeah, I have definitely. two questions here that are more specifically for you, Alex. Um, the first one, um, let me read this. I see if I can read this in the right flow. Okay, so CVPs like Segment and Rudderstack offer data collection libraries. Um, some ETL capabilities from sources and downstream to destinations that include not only data warehouses, but also third party marketing tools um, of not only event data, but user traits and properties. Right? Snowplow overlaps in data collection, but how does it cover audience building or user identity resolution and sending data to marketing destinations? Yeah, great, great question from Ian. So, um, so the, way, the way to think of it really is that yeah, you know, we talked a little bit about kind of bundling and unbundling. Um, the, the, the CDPs are trying to kind of build a bit of a bundle. So do a bit of event data collection, do a bit of ETL, pulling in from kind of um, SaaS tools, um, and then kind of uh, land data in a warehouse, but also land data like, uh, like Ian has observed in different downstream uh, marketing platforms. So that's kind of a bundle. At Snowplow, we're much more focused on the behavioral data, making sure we uh, we help companies to generate the best behavioral data. And then we get it into the warehouse and the lake, um, ready to meet kind of any use case. Um, so, you know, we have plenty of customers that are not trying to get data into um, downstream marketing destinations. They're trying to solve you know, product analytics use cases or build customer facing metrics or, um, you know, uh, fraud detection or whatever. So I would say that um, really the way to think of it is a CDP is kind of do, trying to do a sort of a bundle and, and, and get a bit of a bit of all the customer data in to many different places. It's kind of a, a fan out kind of approach, but Snowplow is focused on getting the best behavioral data um, into the warehouse and the lake and, and the stream. Um, in terms of the last part of the question, so, 
uh, lots of our customers build bespoke um, audiences. They do identity resolution. So Snowplow Behavioral Data has all of the um, different IDs and identifiers in it. Um, so loads of our customers build their own bespoke ones, um, and those are particular to their businesses. So you know they're not um, they're not using the kind of um, simple rules of a CDP. They're they're building in SQL kind of their own um, segmentations, their own like identity stitches and, and things like that. Um, and then um, some, so we have some customers who are using um, having done that. They're then shipping um, shipping those um, those user profiles, for example, out to marketing tools using reverse ETL, which is uh, is a new kind of category of, of, of software, which is in um, in, in uh, the, the modern data stack and in your diagram, for example. Yeah, I, I think of it as um, you can choose the best in class tools to do exactly what you described the census, the high touches are the reverse ETL tools Alex is referring to. Um, but at the same time, if you want to build your own um, your own lookalike models and so on, or work very deeply with the data, you can only do that in sort of this model where you have access to the underlying data. If you have sort of the package solution, you're limited to the, to the functionality that that package solution supports. And it, what's interesting about today is you don't have to sacrifice the ease of use aspect. Pack, the CDPs are packaged and they're easy to use because it's all under sort of one umbrella. The best in class tools today are just as easy, but they use an, a, you know your own data warehouse, something is from a company perspective open in terms of how they access that data that you still own and control. Exactly. Um, another question for uh, you, Snow, uh, for Alex, uh, from Chris. Um, do you have an approach to capturing, analyzing, or dynamically using behavioral data? that is unique or particularly well done in your platform? Yeah, I, I really like that question. Um, so this is gonna be a, a, a big thing that we're gonna spend um, quite a lot of time explaining on our, our website. We've started to kind of um, kind of really carve out behavioral data as its own thing and, and started to communicate that on the website. So it's really important we explain it. So I think there's quite a few things, but I'll, I'll, you know, mindful of time, I'll, I'll keep them fairly brief. Um, so we have a very rich model for behavioral data. Um, so a lot of people sort of send in unstructured JSONs. We have a kind of concept of an event plus an arbitrary set of entities. It's all JSON schema, so it's all structured, it's all versioned. Um, so it's, it's a very, very rich um, uh, view of, 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 of what, a, what a customer is doing. Um, so that's an important thing. Um, I think that we do a lot of uh, auto tracking and sophisticated kind of um, context um, collection in the host environment. So, you know, we've been building our trackers since 2012. Um, we came from an analytics background. So, you know, it was really important to us that we got really good, um, really good kind of contextual data coming in with the events. We then do a lot of enrichment on the data that flows through. So we take those kind of um, behavioral signals and then we add a lot of extra metadata to them. We do a lot of kind of widening on the on the signal. Um, and then, yeah, quality. So um, we don't drop behavioral data. Uh, we quarantine it if there are uh, issues with some of it. And we, we make it possible to kind of uh, fix those issues and replay that through the, the pipeline. So um, that's really important in terms of not making sure the data is kind of accurate and complete. Um, um, and then we do data modeling as well. So um, once the uh, very granular behavioral data is landed in the warehouse, we have um, data models that run for BigQuery and Snowflake and Redshift that work with the web data, work with the mobile data, and that's all kind of done out, out the box. So it just means that kind of the, the data you get in your warehouse is kind of, it's been kind of sufficiently processed and modeled and aggregated, ready for, for, for downstream, downstream platforms like, like Indicative, for example. Last question. Um... Uh, from Tudor, what open source license is Snowplow using? Uh, so it's Apache 2. Um, and the way to think of Snowplow really is um, the open source is what we've been building since 2012. That's all Apache 2 license. And that's our kind of core data transit layer. We call that the behavioral data engine. And then the, the, the paid for platform um, is that plus kind of the fabric that runs all this inside your own cloud account, um, add plus a kind of a behavioral data management layer it's not an analytics UI. It doesn't give you kind of dashboards or the answers. It helps you kind of operate um, operate the, 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 the platform and uh, work with your data structures and things like that to make sure you're doing great quality um, behavioral data collection. Great. I think I know we wanted to um, end at 
1245, uh, 1245 Eastern. Um, so that uh, pretty much wraps up our webinar today. Um, thank you to everyone who, had, who attended today, who stayed with us for the duration of the event and who sent in their questions. Um, I know we have a couple other questions we didn't get to um, and we can, you know, I'll send them to Jeremy and Alex. Thank you to Alex for your generosity with your answers and your time. Thank you guys. Um, and thank you to Jeremy for hosting today's webinar. Um, the follow-up to this Big webinar, uh, there is a follow-up to this webinar. So part two is on July 14th with a live event um, hosted by Snowplow. So we're reversing roles. Jeremy will be interviewed by Alex on product analytics um, powered by the best behavioral data. Um, so join us for that. We'll send out an invite. Um, you can reach us at indicative.com or follow us on LinkedIn or Twitter at Get Indicative. You can also uh, reach Snowplow at snowplowanalytics.com. And uh, don't forget, at the conclusion of this, you'll get a link to a free trial of Indicative. Um, take the product for a spin. We'd love to hear your feedback. And uh, have a good rest of the day. Thanks so much, everyone. Thank you. Thanks, Alex. Great chatting. Thanks, Thanks Ari. Thanks, everyone.